Hi, I'm Sarah Morehouse, and this video will talk about how to make your kitchen safe to prepare gluten-free foods. Gluten is a large protein molecule, but it's still just a molecule, microscopic in size, and it can fit into the pores of many materials, not to mention tiny little chips and cracks, and it stays there pretty much forever. And if it makes its way onto or into your gluten-free food, your food is not gluten-free anymore. Sensitivity to gluten varies, but in general, people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity cannot tolerate more than 20 parts per million, and that isn't much. So cross-contamination is a big issue. I'll also talk about what kinds of tools are necessary and, or useful for gluten-free cooking and baking. If you have been cooking foods that contain gluten in your kitchen, there's some good news. Glass, aluminum, and stainless steel are non-porous so you do not need to replace anything in your kitchen made of those materials. Your silverware and your Corel and glazed ceramic dishes will be fine. So will your mason jars and Pyrex and Corningware casseroles and storage containers and similar things from other brands. Your aluminum and stainless steel pots and pans will also be okay. If you have any enameled cast iron, that will be fine too as long as the enamel finish is not chipped. All of these things are safe to share between gluten food and gluten free food as long as you clean them very thoroughly in between. What I mean by very thoroughly is that there shouldn't be any film or residue left. You don't need to check with a microscope, you can see or feel it. If Martha Stewart wouldn't consider it clean, then it's not clean enough to be safe. That's the beauty of these smooth non-porous materials. The bad news is that most other materials found in the kitchen are porous and they will be sources of gluten contamination, so you have to get rid of them. This includes wooden and bamboo implements, anything plastic, vinyl, silicone, or rubber, nonstick cookware, unglazed ceramics like Pampered Chef, and unglazed cast iron like Lodge cookware. Because of all the cracks and crevices where crumbs could be hiding, you'll need to replace your toaster or maybe even your toaster oven, and you'll need a new sponge. I turned all my old dish towels into rags and got new ones of those too. All in all, getting your kitchen ready to cook gluten-free is hard work and very expensive. So it's important that everyone who lives with you, or who may come over and use your kitchen, understands that gluten cannot touch your new gluten-free bamboo, plastic, and non-stick stuff. The levels of contamination that trigger your immune system are microscopically tiny. Many of my gluten-free friends still have their old cast iron and Pampered Chef stuff, even though it's contaminated. I've lined my great-grandmother's cast iron skillet with aluminum foil to cook gluten-free cornbread, and I line my old Pampered Chef stoneware cookie sheets with baker's parchment to make gluten-free pizza practically every week. I never got rid of my old gluten-y toaster oven either. I just lined the rack with aluminum foil. I do the same thing whenever I go to a cookout. You put a piece of aluminum foil over the grill, throw your hamburger or chicken leg down with the rest of them, and as long as they don't touch, it's fine. Any way you can save money and still be safe is a good thing. The ideal situation is for your whole house to be gluten-free. Sometimes a whole family goes gluten-free because it's more convenient, or because there's a child who needs to eat the restricted diet and the parents want to reduce the chances of gluten accidents. My husband eats gluten-free at home, except for some snack food, which he keeps separate, but he eats gluten when he, whenever he's out. But sometimes you'll have to share your kitchen with gluten. Sometimes it's too expensive to feed everyone gluten-free. Other times, people who don't have a problem with gluten aren't willing to take on a set of restrictions that isn't necess necessary for them. And there are other reasons why there might be gluten in your kitchen, such as if you live with housemates who aren't related to you, or if you live with your parents or in-laws, and it's not their priority. That makes it hard because cross-contamination happens so easily. So if you do have to share your kitchen with people who eat gluten, the first thing you have to do is keep the gluten ingredients to themselves. If you have a bowl of fruit out, Make sure that crackers don't fall into it. If you have a box of gluten-free cereal, it's probably best to transfer it to a storage container that seals airtight, so that if somebody else spills their cereal, it won't get in. Since they're going to be cooking with gluten in the kitchen where you have your gluten-free wooden spoon and your gluten-free plastic cutting board and your gluten-free nonstick frying pan, they can't use those things to cook gluten with, or else they will no longer be safe for you to use. The easiest thing to do is color code. I colored the handles of my wooden spoons blue. I bought cutting boards with blue corners, and I bought a blue silicone handle for my frying pan. My sponge sits in a blue sponge caddy. Everything that's blue in my kitchen is gluten-free. Of course, now that's irrelevant because my husband eats gluten-free too, but if he didn't, at least he would know that he has to keep his gluten away from those things. 
Remember that glass, glazed ceramics, aluminum, and stainless steel are okay to share as long as they're washed thoroughly in between uses. If you have a stick of butter in the fridge, it needs to be labeled as gluten-free. In keeping with the blue theme, I use pieces of blue painter's tape on the containers so that I don't have to actually write anything. Everybody in the house, or visiting the house, needs to know that means they can't butter their bread and then put their knife back in the butter. You take a spoon, take off the amount of butter you want, then butter your bread with that. That way the crumbs don't get back into the butter. Same goes for peanut butter, jelly, mustard, salsa, whatever. Maybe you should stick a sign to the fridge in big blue letters. Hopefully everyone will cooperate and be mindful. If they don't, maybe you should leave all the lights on and don't keep your music turned down the next time they gluten you and you're up all night with gut pain so bad it gives you the shakes. While it's possible to share a kitchen with people who don't cook and eat gluten-free, it's not possible if they do anything with wheat flour or baking mix. The reason is that wheat dusts up terribly. If somebody takes out a bag of flour and scoops a cup of it, it's going to be literally 24 hours before all of those infinitesimally small flour particles settle down, and they'll be all over the place. On your counters, in the fruit basket, in the jar of utensils, on your sponge, in your pots and pans, they'll get in your food that way. Plus, you'll walk through the kitchen and breathe them in. Some of them will go down the back of your throat and you'll swallow them, and if you're very sensitive, you can get glutened from that. Nobody can cook with wheat flour or wheat baking mix in a gluten-free kitchen. Side note, most cat food and dog food has wheat in it. It's terrible for the animals because they're meant to be eating meat, but it's a cheap way to fill them up. If you pour out of the bag, cover your face with a dust mask or a bandana while you do it. And if you touch your cat's or dog's food, or if they lick you, now you have gluten on you, so wash your hands. Better yet, get your pet onto grain-free food if you can afford it. Now I'd like to talk about a few tools that will make your life easier. I know money is probably going to be really tight for a while because you had to replace a bunch of stuff. And gluten-free food is expensive. But if you were eating out a lot before, you won't be now, so that will save you some money. And if you want to eat well without having to mortgage your firstborn, you're going to have to cook. Proper tools will make that faster and easier and give you better results. So here are the basics. If you haven't really cooked much before, here's what to start out with. You need a sharp chef's knife, a paring knife, and a long serrated knife. Mine are Cutco and they were half an investment, half a way to help a friend who is trying to get by by selling Cutco. Both ways they were worth it. They hold an edge like nobody's business. But you can go to the nearest Corral outlet and get Chicago cutlery knives which are much cheaper and they do just fine. While you're at the Corral outlet, pick up a couple of those antibacterial plastic cutting boards. You need cutting boards that are big enough. That means that if you take your longest knife and lay it from one corner to another diagonally, it should fit with a little room to spare. Get a can opener, a vegetable peeler, a strainer, a set of measuring cups, and a set of measuring spoons, two mixing bowls, a rubber spatula, a pancake flipper, and a couple bamboo mixing spoons, a couple sets of tongs, a ladle, a couple big serving spoons, two cookie sheets, and a roasting pan. Also get two saucepans, a big frying pan and a smaller one, and at least one big stock pot, like six quarts. Corel outlets are great because you can equip your whole kitchen in one stop, and the price is good for what you're getting. Walmart stuff is not so good quality and you'll end up having to replace half of it, and Bed Bath & Beyond is overpriced. Corel outlet is like the sweet spot. Watch out for big sales right after Thanksgiving and then again in the spring right before Mother's Day and wedding season. Now if you're excited about cooking and you don't have one of these yet, you might feel some temptation to buy fancy gadgets like a really good stand mixer or a bread machine. Don't waste your money. A KitchenAid stand mixer is like the Mustang of the kitchen world, but it's never going to be a necessity for you because gluten-free dough doesn't require the arm strength and endurance that wheat dough requires. Get one if you know you're going into business making gluten-free cakes, or you know you're going to use their various attachments like the food mill or the sausage stuffer, but otherwise save your $500. As for the bread machine, there are gluten-free bread recipes for the bread machine, but you can easily convert them to bake in the oven. The thing about gluten-free bread is that it doesn't require kneading. You just stir it and let it rise as much as you can before baking it. And while you bake it, you need to keep a sharp eye on it. So bread machines just aren't optimal for making gluten-free bread. Also, if you have a bread machine that you previously used to make gluten-y bread, Take the paddle out of the bucket and clean out the little stock that it sits on and also the little socket in the paddle with like a water pick or something. You can't have any residual gluten-y dough baked in there or you'll keep poisoning yourself. 
I told you not to waste your $500 on a KitchenAid stand mixer, but if you do want a sexy beast of a motor in your kitchen, a Cuisinart food processor is the thing for you. You're making your own foods. Fast food is no longer fast, and going out for fancy dinner is rarely an option. This thing will make it possible to make a quick dinner quicker and make a fancy dinner without wanting to blow up your kitchen. In the past week, I've used mine to slice peppers, turn lamb stew meat into ground lamb for gyros, great carrots, chop nuts, minced garlic and ginger, puree squash, mashed potatoes, and mixed streusel topping. It's the best money I've ever spent. Keep an eye out for coupons and deals on websites like Retail Me Not, and also don't be afraid to buy a factory refurb. This one is just fun. It's a spiral vegetable cutter. It costs about $45 on Amazon.com, or if you want the metal version, you can spend a lot more than that. It comes with different blades to cut vegetable noodles of different sizes. I've made noodles out of zucchini, cucumbers, squash, sweet potatoes, potatoes, and raw beets. It's the most fun you can have in the kitchen without having a food fight. It's great if you're tired of the not-quite-as-good-as-wheat gluten-free pasta, or if you just want your vegetable dishes and salads to stop being boring. I know it sounds crazy, but I didn't even like zucchini until it was cut in spirals. I know, I sound like I'm four. Whatever. Zucchini is good for you, and it's cheap. While the spiral cutter is probably the least necessary of all the cooking tools, it can still be really helpful, because if we don't fill up on vegetables, we're stuck eating all meat, which isn't so good for you or the environment, or eating a ton of rice and potatoes, which will make some of us pre-diabetic and the rest of us bored. Now on to the kitchen tools that you can use for gluten-free baking. If you want to eat biscuits, English muffins, bread, cake, cookies, so forth, and you don't want to pay an arm and a leg for some pretty disappointing product, or two arms, two legs, and your firstborn child for gluten-free bakery products, then you need to bake. Fortunately, it's not very hard, as long as you can follow simple instructions and you have the right equipment. You can get a kitchen scale for about $15, and it's well worth it. You can also get one for $50, but don't bother. All you need is a readout that will do both ounces and grams, and a tear button. Many gluten-free recipes are still measured by volume, but the European ones and the really good American ones are measured in grams. The reason for that is that ingredients settle out, or they have different sizes of granules, and long story short, weight is a more accurate way to measure than volume, and accuracy really counts for gluten-free baking. If you're measuring gluten-free flour by volume, you have to spoon the fluffy stuff into your measuring cup and level it off with the back of a table knife. It's time-consuming, and your expensive ingredients go everywhere. If you're measuring by weight, you put your mixing bowl on the scale and hit tear. Then you start with your first ingredients. 50 grams? Okay. Add your ingredient until it says 50, and hit tear so it's back to zero. Next ingredient. 150 grams? Okay. So you add your second ingredient until the scale reads 150 and hit tear. You don't even need a measuring cup. Baking parchment is a multi-purpose tool in a gluten-free kitchen. You can use it to line your old gluten-contaminated cookie sheets so you can still use them. That also makes it so you don't have to use cooking spray to prevent sticking. You can use it to make a collar that goes around your bread pan so that your wimpy gluten-free dough has a higher wall to climb as it rises, which produces taller, less dense loaves of bread. You can put a lump of gluten-free pie or pizza dough between two sheets of baking parchment and use your hands to press it flat, which works much better than trying to roll it with a rolling pin. You'll find parchment paper in most grocery stores right next to the wax paper, but do not try to use them interchangeably. Wax paper can't go in the oven. Parchment can. Silpat baking mats are optional. They're not cheap, but they are indestructible. You use them to line your cookie sheets instead of the parchment, and you'll never have scorching or sticking problems again. And gluten-free cookies do scorch easily, so that's something to consider if you like baking. If you want to do huge batches of gluten-free holiday cookies, they're a great idea because you can get away with having fewer cookie sheets. Speaking of cookies, if you like making them, you'll end up wanting a couple of these dishers. They're like smaller versions of what the lunch ladies use. Gluten-free dough is so sticky that if you try to scoop it with a regular spoon, it will end in tears and your kitchen will look like Jackson Pollock visited. These disher things just plop the dough right out in a perfect little ball when you squeeze the handle, and they make the job a lot quicker. If you go to Christmas Tree Shop, you can get a cookie sheet for about $2. It will last for about two uses before the finish starts to wear off, which is not really a problem if you use parchment. But there's another downside. The metal is thin and cheap, and it heats up unevenly. It heats up fast and cools down fast. This is a problem because gluten-free dough is picky and temperamental. You'll have burnt parts and undercooked parts. Get bakeware that's heavier and has more thermal mass, so it heats up and cools down evenly and gradually. 
Stoneware and cast iron are excellent as long as you get them new so you don't have gluten contamination in their pores. Glass is fine, including Corelware. KitchenAid nonstick metal bakeware is my favorite. So thank you for joining me for this little discourse on how to equip your gluten-free kitchen. Good luck.